Okay, very good. So I invite you to try doing the exact same problem here, but upping the temperature from room temperature to this time a thousand degrees and see if in fact we get an exponential change in the number of vacant sites. Okay, so take a moment to, to do that and we'll show that answer in a moment. Okay, so hopefully you got to <clears throat> an answer here that showed that that total number of sites here shown with a little more resolution now, more de more decimal points. So I earlier had this as 8.0 times 10 to the 28. Now we're raising this to a, a larger, um, well, larger in the denominator here. thousand degrees C is 1273 K. We have the same Boltzmann constant, same activation energy. And so putting these two together, you should have got an answer at about 2.16 times 10 to the 29 vacancy sites in this case. 2.16 times 10 to the 29 sites are vacant in this case. Okay. Looks like there's an error on here, 2 10, 10 to the 29. Sorry about that. <clears throat> okay, so you've seen here um, that our previous understanding for how matter expands was guided by bond length extension. But now what we've learned is that as we raise the temperature, s spots in our lattices of metals become empty. And so there's kind of an interesting consequence on this. If we're creating these empty sites, we ask, where do those atoms go? We can't destroy matter after all. Where do the atoms go? And so what happens with increasing temperature, we temporarily break a bond and the atom can shift into the bulk material elsewhere. So it's a bit of a dominoes result where atoms will ultimately make room for that new atom to create that vacancy and ultimately, atoms will have to locate themselves to the outermost regions of the material in question. So here's a, an interesting microscopy exam, uh, result that puts, puts this in perspective. So here's a low-energy electron microscope view of the top of a nickel-aluminum alloy that we now understand a little bit. So a solid solution here. It is the 110 surface of this alloy. <coughs> And we're going to oscillate the temperature from a low temperature value to a little bit higher, 770 to 785. You can see that temperature range reflected here. So here's our thermometer going up and down. And then what we're going to do is monitor the area of one of the islands that we see on screen. So here you can see an island of that 110 here as a rounded island. So there are many unit cells up here. So that island is represented here. Here's the cross section of it, and that island is there. And if we monitor the area of that and see how that's changing, you, we can think about the consequences. So if I'm increasing the temperature, I'm creating vacancies. Atoms must be going to the surface. So what do you think will happen to the area of this island? Will it decrease or increase? Take a minute to think about that, and then let's watch the video and find out. <clears throat> okay, so as we raise the temperature, the islands grow. As we shrink the temperature, decrease the temperature, the islands shrink. So vacancies are being created beneath the surface that we're watching with this microscopy video. And we're seeing atoms move to the surface as a consequence and growing an island of a 110 nickel alloy here. Really interesting result that puts to perspective the idea of calculating vacancies and what that means. Okay. Um, 
What about some other type of vacancies? We have absences in ceramics that are possible too. Here there's some interesting charge balancing that we must consider, right? When we remove one vacancy, we have to consider electroneutrality again. Okay, so we can have absences in ceramics and we can also have interstitials as well, okay? So what's known about interstitials? Well, we can have interstitials of cations. So cations are very small. We've seen that cations result from the contraction of an atom by giving up electrons, so the atom gets smaller as a consequence. Okay, so we can see these type of interstitial cations happening, so two cations in the same spot in the lattice. We can also be missing cations entirely, so notice we are missing a light blue. Okay, so that's possible. Um, we can also have anion vacancies. Okay, so we're missing the red anion in this lattice here. And the last question we have for you is, what about anion interstitials? So thinking about this, see if you can ask this question. And pause the video once you have an answer. So why are there no anion interstitials commonly? So that would be putting an anion into the same anion volume here. Two anions in the same volume. Why is that extremely unlikely? Is it A, because cations are too small? B, cations are too big? C, anions are too small? Or D, anions are too big? Okay, well, hopefully you recall that anions result from <coughs> adding volume as they capture an electron to go from neutral to the anion form. So they, they are large species, large ionic species, and to put two of them in the same lattice site would require an extreme amount of energy. You can imagine that Q value. We saw that it was threefold high to put um, self-interstitials in place in pure metals, but in an ionic compound, this is going to be huge for an anion, and it's not going to be favorable. That won't, won't be possible. So that numerator for NV over NS <coughs> is, is going to be way too much activation energy and the likelihood of that is very small. So D is your right answer. Okay, as I inferred, when we remove one type of ion, we have to think about electroneutrality. So there are two types of special defects here where we establish that idea, that charge balancing. So when we remove one anion and we also remove a cation to charge balance, so we're removing both a cation and an anion to create vacancies that are near one another. The pair of them together is called a Schottky defect, where we've removed both one of each in the lattice to remove one, one formula unit of the material. <clears throat> a Frenkel defect can also occur. A Frenkel defect is where there is a cation vacancy and a cation interstitial pair. So we put two cations in the same cation spot and we have nearby a cation vacancy here. And if those two are kind of paired, we have a Frenkel defect. Okay. And these go by a similar formula. Again, the, the defect in question, activation energy to do it divided by uh, KT, so a negative exponent on that, and that's going to go with with e to the power of that value. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So we've seen lots of examples. Let's let's rewind and review a little bit. We've seen impurities in metals. So those impurities could establish a substitutional solid solution where we ask the impurity to substitute per the Hume-Rothery rules into the lattice sites of that solution metal. When um, the impurity is small enough, we can see that we can ask that impurity to locate itself into interstitial sites in that solvent metal. So this example was carbon going into iron, for example. Okay, And that can happen randomly as well. So we can use the term solution there as well. Um, we can then ask the question, well, what happens if we're in neither of these conditions? So where we get some 
of the substitution of solid solution happening. So that's represented down here through the majority of the material. But if we've oversaturated the host metal, the solvent metal, with the impurity B, the solute, we can crystallize, create new phases of matter. Here an ordered intermetallic can result where we have perfect rows, for example, of one metal uh, next to other perfect rows of the next metal. So this new phase can result. And so the second phase crystallizes within the substitution of solid solution of the other. And so clearly there's a different composition and a unique formula for that new phase, and it's got a different structure, of course. So we can describe phase separation where we have the substitution um, solid solution for most of it, and it's hosting another compound of definite uh, composition and, and unique structure. <clears throat> okay, and lastly, we'll go over some linear defects. So as we mentioned, uh, we've talked about all the zero-dimensional defects now including some very specialized ones where there are pairs in ceramics or uh, um, materials based on oppositely charged ions coming together. And now we'll move on to linear versions here. So as we know, these views of errors might all locate to one another. So imagine where we have not just one um, additional atom, but rows of additional atoms here. Okay, so notice there's a third dimension here as well. So a whole extra plane of atoms has inserted itself into a lattice that was otherwise perfect in both spots. <clears throat> so this extra plane of atoms establishes now a linear defect, one-dimensional defect because of the extra um, lined up sets of atoms here. Okay. So um, this little symbol here, this perpendicular type symbol here, is what's given to what's called an edge dislocation. As you can see here, the extra plane of atoms here is, has resulted in a dislocation, and that exists in three dimensions, so all the way down the axis, looking straight into this perpendicular symbol. We have a row of those defects, and so that's a linear defect. Okay, and similar arguments, imagine the lattice here, so we we're going to have some compression as bonds near that, um, near that are going to be asked to accommodate that extra row, so right in here, these bonds are going to be short and compressed, and then over in here, these bonds are going to be very long as they accommodate that extra plane of atoms. <coughs> okay, so there's something called a Berger's vector that helps us quantify this. The exercise is to walk around uh, a defect and add back a Berger's vector to get back to where you started. So we'll make use of the image in A in a moment. As we consider walking around a defect if present. Okay, so here's one of those edge dislocations. We would give it a perpendicular symbol, for example. And if we start at, say, position N here, and then we walk one, two, three, four spots up, and then start turning one, two, three, four, five. So from N to M, M to M. And L, M, N, O, oh, and then down to P. So go down four, one, two, three, four, down to spot P. In, in my travels from N to O, I traveled five vector spots. So I need to travel the same amount. So as I go from P, trying to close the loop here, I travel five spots over. One, two, three, four, five. So completing a cycle with the same number of steps in either direction, up, left, down, to the right, I've ended up over here, one unit spot over from where I need to be. The vector, the Berger's vector, is described as the 
vector needed to take you back to where you started. So we started at spot M. And so I've got, I need to add a vector this way. So that vector here is given symbol B. That, that is how we represent the edge dislocation as we've walked around it in the lattice. <clears throat> okay, so that's kind of shown, those steps are shown here again, starting at M, walking in this case three down, walking in this case four spots over, up three, and then um, walking this time uh, four over again, we would not be f far enough, and so I would need to add a vector to get us back, <clears throat> okay? Okay, um, other dislocations exist here um, where we can imagine not an extra plane of atoms, but a dislocation. So a whole row of atoms, a whole block of atoms has shifted down relative to the others. And so this dislocation is what's called a screw dislocation. And so when one does the Berger's vector for that, you end up finding that you end up needing an additional vector that is parallel to the dislocation line here. Okay, so clearly there's a, a dislocation line that goes through this material. And in this case, a Berger's vector that is parallel to this dislocation line where I've shifted material down along this error relative to the, the rest of the material here <clears throat> if the Berger's vector is parallel to the dislocation, we have a screw type dislocation. Okay, and so the screw type gets its name from the thought that if we were to keep walking circles as represented by the blue trace in our diagram here, we would always end up walking in a screw down an axis that is our dislocation line, and the Berger's vector would end up being parallel to that dislocation line. Okay, <clears throat> so we'll end there, and then we'll um, continue with the next video on grain boundaries.